Sister Jensen and I are pleased to be here, along with members of our, our family, our children. I acknowledge my total dependence upon the Lord, and I have prayed and do pray now that during this devotional we will allow the Holy Ghost to be the true teacher that He is, about which I will say more in my message. As President Samuelson said, the theme of this Education Week and the title to my remarks is that all may be edified, coming from section 88, verse 122. Quote, Appoint among yourselves a teacher, and let not all be spokesmen at once, but let one speak at a time, and listen. let all listen unto his sayings, that when all have spoken, that all may be edified of all, and that every man may have an equal privilege. The word edify comes from the French edifier, and from the Latin edificare, and means to improve spiritually and instruct. The Oxford Dictionary gives the meaning in religious use to build up the Church, the soul, in faith and holiness, or to benefit spiritually, to strengthen, support. Thus, to edify is to instruct and improve the soul in knowledge generally, and in particular to increase in moral and religious knowledge, in faith and holiness. To edify is part of, a part of a revelatory process. The word revelatory refers to the supernal gifts of the Spirit, the source of all light and truth. I witness to you that the Holy Ghost is the true teacher in this work. Teaching and learning that lead to edification and heavenly confirmation are fundamental to the Father's plan and require five principles gleaned from verse 122. They are, one, a teacher is appointed and recognized as such by the learners. Two, teaching and discussion are governed by order and reverence. Three, what is discussed or said revolves around divine doctrines or truths. Those who are not speaking have a duty to actively listen. And finally, both teacher and listener or the learner, participate respectfully to invite the Spirit. Fundamental to my message and the theme is the word that, preceding the words, all may be edified. The placement of the word that sets up what some call a cause and effect relationship, often emphasized using the words in order that or so that. For edification to occur, it is necessary to have an appointed teacher order and reverence, divine doctrines and truths, listeners, and respectful participation. It is instructive to note that the word edify and the word edifice come from the same root. Building an edifice that will pass the test of time requires the right plan and the right materials. Similarly, to be edified and have heavenly confirmation of your spiritual growth, a foundation has to be in place and it has to be right. The, the need for a foundation is made more relevant from a lesson learned during the building of the Salt Lake Temple. In February 1853, President Brigham Young presided over the groundbreaking services. Work proceeded on the excavations and foundation stones for the temple until Johnston's army arrived in 1857. To protect the work, he instructed the saints to fill in the temple trenches with dirt resulting in a vacant lot that looked like a plowed field when the soldiers walked past it. Following their departure, the dirt was removed and the work continued. A few years later, President Young, along with others, made an inspection of the foundation and discovered faulty foundation stones. He declared, quote, The foundation has to be right. This temple must last into the millennium. The faulty stones were replaced with the large granite stones you know today. His relevant words, the foundation has to be right, serve my purpose to emphasize foundational principles which must be right so that all may be edified. Let us now examine more carefully these five essential principles from Doctrine and Covenants 88, 122 that lead to edification. The appointment of a teacher in the Church denotes someone with authority to appoint another. In other words, all true authority in this restored Church is under the direction 
of or submissive to a higher authority, ultimately God's authority. Today this is done under the direction of ecclesiastical leaders such as bishops or priesthood presidents with priesthood keys, affirmed by this truth from the Book of Mormon. And it came to pass that none received authority to preach or to teach except it were by him from God. It is clear that worthiness is essential from this Book of Mormon verse. They had appointed just men to be their teachers. Being a just person is to be guided by truth, divine doctrine, and reason or correct principle. In the Bible, the word just is to be righteous or to conform to the laws of God. Alma taught that trust no one to be your teacher nor your minister except he be a man of God walking in his ways and keeping his commandments. At home, an appointment to teach comes from or by the presiding authority of the Father, quoting the, the hand, family handbook. The Father presides over the family and is responsible to teach the children. The mother is an equal partner and counselor to her husband. She helps him teach their children the laws of God. If there is no father, the mother presides. As a people and a church, we need to improve our attitudes toward and performance of order and reverence, both at home and in our places of worship. In our society today, we see more and more evidences of a drift towards casualness in speech, dress, and appearance. I heard President Hinckley say that there is a distressing lack of reverence in the Church. I have often heard one of the Twelve say that we need not point the finger at others. Rather, he lovingly and candidly says, You fix you. That this was a concern in the early days of the Church is evidenced by this statement by the Prophet Joseph Smith. Quote, but to return to the subject of order, in ancient days councils were conducted with such strict propriety that no one was allowed to whisper, be weary, leave the room, or get uneasy in the least until the voice of the Lord by revelation or the voice of the council by the Spirit was obtained, which has not been observed in this Church to the present time. It was understood in ancient days that if one man could stay in council, another could. And if the President could spend his time, the members could also. But in our councils, generally, one will be uneasy, another asleep, one praying, another not, one's mind on the business of the council, and another thinking on something else." Close quote. Everything taught in this Church may fit under three headings. One, doctrine. Two, principles. Three, applications or commandments. On the screen you will see a pyramid divided horizontally into three equal sections. At the top are the words doctrine, the why. In the middle section are the word principles, the what. And in the bottom, or the largest portion of the pyramids, are the words applications, or the commandments, that is, the how. As a listener to sayings that come from the pulpit, the classroom, and the home, I have observed that speakers often devote more time and attention to applications and commandments or the how, and less effort is given to the doctrine or the grand why and the principles or the what. As parents and teachers, we should provide our learners with a balance of all three, for as the Savior taught, these things, commandments and applications, he ought to have done and not leave the other doctrine and principles undone. Or, as President Packer has taught and retaught, quote, true doctrine understood changes attitudes and behavior more than the teaching of behavior will change behavior. About 15 years ago, a committee was formed to improve teaching in the Church. The Sunday School program, Teacher Development, was rewritten and called Teacher Improvement. I remember Elder Holland counseling the writing committee members to remember the Savior's example, who was a teacher sent from God. Following the implementation of teacher improvement a few years later at Church headquarters, those responsible for this emphasis in teaching felt an important element was missing—the concept of learning 
was relegated to the back seat of teaching. To place learning in its proper role, the February 2007 worldwide satellite broadcast on learning and teaching was developed. The general presidency of the Sunday School has since made a concerted effort to improve both learning and teaching in the Church. As part of the effort to improve learning and teaching, the excellent publication, Teaching No Greater Call, was refreshed. I pause to make a comment about this manual. With what I know about education and with the many books written on the subject, I consider it one of the finest books on education anywhere, and I commend it to you for your personal and family use and home library. I encourage you to pay careful attention to Section 5, Basic Principles of Gospel Teaching, Invite Diligent Learning. Stake and ward leaders are encouraged to make use of these materials and emphasis. Thus, in Church Handbook 2, the word learning is given an emphasis not seen in earlier Church manuals. For example, the stated purpose of Sunday School is, quote, strengthen individuals and families' faith in Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ through teaching, learning, and fellowshipping. In that same chapter, under the heading Improving Learning and Teaching in the Ward, we read, quote, Members of the Ward Sunday School Presidency serve as specialists in the Ward's efforts to improve learning and teaching. They help leaders orient newly called teachers and improve gospel learning and teaching in their organizations. Close quote. The scriptures themselves are our best sources on learning and teaching the Savior being the perfect model of a learner-teacher. In addition to the scriptures, an extremely valuable source is the interview Dr. L. Tom Perry conducted with President Boyd K. Packer, published in the June 2007 Ensign, which is the printed version of the February 2007 Worldwide Satellite Broadcast. In the following list, I draw upon President Packer's wise counsel and add one or two of my own. Each is introduced with, I am becoming a diligent learner when, when I am teachable and want to learn, when I study, search, ponder, and liken the scriptures to myself and my circumstances, when I ask questions and listen to both what is said by the teacher and not said verbally by others, but by the Spirit to me, when I do not resent correction or instruction, when I stay at it and demonstrate persistence, when I observe others, especially the example and counsel of older people, when I pray in specifics for myself and for the teacher, when I retire early and arise early, when I write impressions, when I am a punctual, reverent listener in Church meetings and at home. It is important to remember that there are basically two kinds of meetings held in this Church. One is formal and the other is informal. Examples of formal meetings in the Church are sacrament meetings, Sunday sessions of state conferences, and general conference. The Saturday evening session of a state conference could be a formal meeting or the presiding officer make it, may make it an informal meeting with audience participation, something we of the Seventy and the Twelve are doing more and more. You have seen or will see that each Education Week presenter determines whether their presentation is formal or informal. Because I will use visuals in my message, this formal devotional will have an element of informality. In a formal meeting, audience participation by way of discussion or comments is not encouraged. For example, in a sacrament meeting, the speaker should not invite the congregation to open their scriptures and follow along. Of course, I may choose to do so on my own and listen attentively, take notes of impressions, and pray for myself, for others, and for the speaker. In a sacrament meeting, as per handbook instructions, the use of object lessons or other visuals is not approved. On the other hand, in informal meetings such as quorum and classroom instruction, primary and seminary and institute classes, and especially church councils, ward and stake, and these include presidency and bishopric councils, 
Listener participation is vital for edification to occur. At home, generally the most effective teaching, teaching is achieved when it is informal. When I was a young boy attending the Old White Church in Mapleton, about 10 miles south of here, I never carried my own set of scriptures to junior Sunday school or the evening sacrament meeting. Frankly, we did not have personal scriptures. It has only been since 1979 and 1981, the years the current English LDS scriptures were published, that we have obtained our own set of scriptures and have become a scripture-carrying people. That we should carry them is implied in the Book of Mormon, quote, Wherefore, it was wisdom in God that we should carry them, the brass plates, with us as we journeyed in the wilderness towards the land of promise. Edification for me is facilitated when I participate in informal instruction, having my scriptures with me as I travel through the wildernesses of life towards my promised land. Of course, I must do more than carry them in my hands. I must open them and carry them in my head and my heart and in my life. All are encouraged to bring their own set of scriptures to informal instructional setting so they may open them and follow along, make comments, and share insights. In connection with that approach, parents and teachers should provide opportunities for others to participate, discuss, ask questions, and share insights and experiences. Remember, inspired questions lead to inspired participation and revelatory experiences. The Prophet Joseph Smith taught, quote, each should speak in his turn and in his place and in his time and season, that there may be perfect order in all things. And every man should be sure that he can throw light upon the subject rather than spread darkness, which may be done by men applying themselves closely to study the mind and will of the Lord, whose Spirit always makes manifest and demonstrates the truth to the understanding of all who are in possession of the Spirit. Close quote. When a husband and wife understand these principles and truths, they are better prepared to lead their children so that they may be edified through gospel learning. Common settings for learning and teaching are family scripture study, family home evening, and mealtime discussions. Church research shows that those settings are more successful when parents make them relaxed, inclusive, expressive, and engaging. Gospel learning that leads to edification at home is more effective when it is more like a conversation than another meeting. This learning is not limited to family home evenings, however. Our children are edified when we daily model correct learning, teaching, and leading. Spontaneous conversations at mealtime discussions, arrival from school, bedtime, a walk, or working together provide brief moments suited to the children's attention span that are often one-on-one -on -one and relevant with real-life experiences. My emphasis thus far has been on these five principles in formal and informal settings such as church sacrament meetings, classrooms, and the home. Another significant setting in which these five principles are applied so that edification may occur is in ward and state councils including presidency and bishopric meetings or councils. The November 2010 and the February 2011 worldwide satellite broadcast on the Church handbooks and on council includes excellent role plays based on doctrines, principles, and applications, as found in Handbook 2. The DVDs illustrated and emphasized what a council meeting should do, be, and accomplish. It is hoped that these excellent instructions will give leaders and parents a greater vision of how they should conduct them. So in summary, the five principles leading to edification are, one, a teacher is appointed and recognized as such by the learners. Two, teaching and discussion are governed by order and reverence. Three, what is discussed or said revolves around divine doctrines or truths. Four, those who are not speaking have a duty to actively listen. And five, both teacher and listener participate respectfully to invite the Spirit. Like teachers, leaders in the Church should strive to edify those whom they have 
who they, whom they lead. Having served here in the heart of Zion, as well as having lived and traveled abroad, I have witnessed different and different teaching and leadership styles. Elder Richard G. Scott articulated these styles for me as follows. The general or commander, the egalitarian or three commanders, the phantom, meaning the self-reliant, the decision maker, or the Lord's leader. I recognize that there are elements of stereotyping in the following descriptions, but there is much to be learned. I'll describe each now and with a visual you can see on the screen. The general or commander, here the presiding officer, such as a bishop or a branch president, either implicitly or explicitly communicates that he presides. Like a military officer, he gives orders to his subordinates and each one dutifully obeys. Next, the egalitarian or three commanders. In this case, the presiding officer divides the responsibility so that each has a third of what is to be accomplished, each clearly understanding the lines and limits for which he is responsible and therefore working to accomplish them. Third, the phantom. A good description for this leader is he does not delegate. He has two worthy able counselors but does not know how to use them or does not have confidence in them and does, does most things himself. Fourth, the decision maker. This model has two counselors or advisors and one decision maker. It is based on the Old Testament account where Moses, as the presiding officer, sat in judgment over all cases, being the decision maker. I believe that the decision-making leader is more common than the first three mentioned. For example, a very good bishop may ask each counselor to suggest a name to fill a calling in the ward. They discuss it openly, and then he announces either verbally or by his actions, thank you for your good counsel, and as I hold the keys, I will now make the decision and ask you to sustain me in it. Now fifth, the Lord's leader. This presiding officer understands and implements the principles of the theme of this Education Week. He understands the source of his authority and what it is to be an appointed teacher. That order and reverence must prevail in the Council meeting. That sayings or divine doctrines and truths will govern all decisions. That listening to each other and to the whisperings of the spirit of inspiration is fundamental to revelation. That respectful participation by all will lead to our theme today, that all may be edified of all. To summarize the role of the appointed teacher in our Education Week theme, I quote from cherished notes in my personal files from a talk given by Elder Spencer W. Kimball to missionaries that I heard as a young missionary 50 years ago. Brother Harold B. Lee, says President Kimball, is my senior, and I am Brother Mark E. Peterson, senior. When we go to work together, he never says, you do this and you can't do this. Brother Lee always says, now, Brother Kimball, what do you think about this? Shall we proceed along this line? Shall we go here? And what shall we do there? Always. He never tells me what I must do. When Brother Peterson and I go, I try to do the same. Brother Peterson, shall we move in this direction? And what shall we do? How do you feel about this? It works out perfectly, says Elder Kimball, and everyone is happy. But there is the senior element. When one of us is senior, someone has to take the responsibility. Someone has to lead out. And that is all that it is. Sometimes I use stick men to show what I mean. I've seen places in missions where the senior companion is the big stick man, about six feet tall, and the little junior companion is way down here. That is not how it should be. We should have stick men the same size. The one has a little more training, and he has been in the, out in the field a little longer. But that does not give him any dictatorial rights. They are both the same size. The one leads out in suggesting." Close quote. The phrase, one leads out in suggesting, has become central to my life and ministry as a husband, father, grandfather, teacher, and church leader. 
Everything we have been saying about leadership in church councils, meetings, and classroom applies equally to marriage and the home and the family. We see in marriages the following, and again, visuals. Here is a husband who is the general or the commander giving orders to his wife he views as his subordinate, and she dutifully obeys him. The next, a husband and wife who see their marriage as 50-50 arrangement, having equally divided their responsibilities. Third, a husband who seeks to manage things himself. Fourth, a husband who sees himself as the decision maker, always seeking, <laughs> always seeking input from his wife on important decisions, and then exercising his authority to decide and asking her to support him. And then finally, a united couple, a husband who understands his role from the example of the Savior, and temple covenants who leads out in suggesting, not demanding, not commanding, and not insisting. He understands this, this humorous anecdote about listening. The Lord gave us two ears and one mouth, so we may hear twice as much as we say. Having served in the Presidency of the Seventy and with regular meetings with the First Presidency, the Quorum of the Twelve, as well as traveling with them and their spouses, I have seen and experienced how the Lord's leaders work in unity and in harmony in Presidency meetings, Church councils, and even in their marriages. In the meetings of the First Presidency of, uh, in the meetings of the Presidency of the Seventy, each expresses his views openly. We listen carefully to each other. We weigh all available information. We discuss, we ponder, we pray, and we always reach a consensus as guided by the Spirit. Our decisions are described in the Doctrine and Covenants. Quote, the decisions of these quorums are to be made in all righteousness, in holiness, and lowliness of heart, meekness, and long-suffering, and in faith, and virtue, and knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. Because the promise is, if these things abound in them, they shall not be unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord. Being fruitful in the knowledge of the Lord is captured by the Apostle Paul with these words. But we have the mind of Christ. Let me be very clear about this. Education will occur only through and by the power of the Holy Ghost. He is the true teacher in all spiritual learning and teaching. Although this is a very large classroom, I'll illustrate these verses with what you will now see on the screen. At the top, I write the word God. And at the bottom, I draw a few stick figures of us, the people, the learner. Then I draw a vertical line representing revelation or communication, connecting God to man and man to God, showing two-way communication of prayer and revelation. To the side and a little bit above the learners, I draw a stick figure of me, the teacher, and draw a line from me to God, connecting us by prayer and revelation. And finally, a line from me to the people showing a connection or a relationship or a role with the people, the learners. This chalkboard drawing is to illustrate that God is the true teacher, and He does so by and through the Holy Ghost, who was sent forth to teach. The importance of being off to the side and a little bit above is confirmed by President Lee. Quote, you cannot lift a soul unless you are standing on higher ground than he is." Close quote. Being on higher ground comes by an assignment to be a teacher, and in, and in informal settings, the invitation to be a spokesman. Thus, in informal settings, we regularly, regularly rotate our position on higher ground happily and willingly as we surrender our place the instant someone else becomes spokesman, allowing all to have an equal privilege that all may be edified of all. Thus, for edification to occur, we have different but not superior roles. Alma taught, quote, And the priest did not esteem himself above his hearer, 
neither was the teacher any better than the learner. Close quote. I will give a caution. No wise parent, teacher, leader, or missionary would ever want to place himself or herself between the Father and the people, thinking that his or her role is to edify. For their primary role is to turn people to the Lord, to allow them to act rather than be acted upon. In particular, parents will pray to be wise as they raise children to know when to answer their children and when to turn them to the Lord to obtain answers. Let me share with you a common example. Most missionaries, if not all, have what we call eternal investigators. An eternal investigator is one who is edified through the love, care, teaching, and testimonies of the missionaries rather than through the Holy Ghost and His role <clears throat> to teach. They, <clears throat> excuse me, they have, in effect, placed themselves between light and truth from God through the Holy Ghost. The investigator learner is dependent upon these wonderful missionaries. Some call this living on borrowed light. Having been a full-time seminary teacher, an early morning seminary coordinator in da daily informal learning settings, I can witness to the truth of Elder Richard G. Scott's wise counsel when he taught, quote, Never, and I mean never, give a lecture or a lesson where there is no student participation. A talking head in the classroom setting is the weakest form of class instruction. The following passage from the Doctrine and Covenants reveals a principle much worth using. And then he quotes section 50, He that receiveth the word by the Spirit of truth receiveth it as it is preached by the Spirit of truth. Wherefore he that preacheth and he that receiveth understand one another, and both are edified and rejoice together. The verbs preach and understand refer to that which is said and heard. It is the same message to all. Edified and rejoice concern that which is communicated by the Holy Ghost. The message can be different and tailored by the Spirit to the needs of each individual. Assure that there is abundant participation because that use of agency by a student authorizes the Holy Ghost to instruct. It also helps the student retain your message. As students verbalize truths, they are confirmed in their souls and strengthen their personal testimonies. Close quote. Elder Scott's wise counsel should help teachers, leaders, and parents to avoid the pitfall of teaching lessons and not people, evidenced by either the comment or the action that, oh, we must hurry on and cover all the material. Those who teach in this way do not allow us to act. Rather, we are being acted upon. Increasing our exercise of ancient agency as teachable learners increases our spiritual growth. Agency is central to authorize the Holy Ghost to edify or instruct. And now I, Nephi, cannot write all things which were taught to my people, neither am I mighty in writing like unto speaking. For when a man speaketh by the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost carrieth it unto the hearts of the children of men. Please note the preposition unto. Only when we exercise our agency will the Holy Ghost edify and carry it into the heart. The Savior said, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in unto him and will sup with him and he with me. In this way we see fulfillment of the promise that the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. In conclusion, edification will occur only when teachers and learners direct all their efforts in a shared responsibility to establish a climate where the converting power of the Spirit is present. The atmosphere or climate must be spiritual, warm, open, and reciprocal. Leaders, teachers, and parents will be more successful as they become more Christ-like and adapt and respond to needs without being coercive or manipulative. By assignment, the appointed teacher is to lead out in suggesting ways to promote learning, teaching divine doctrine, and doing all in his or her power to create an atmosphere or setting that will invite the Holy Ghost to come and do what He alone may do, so that all may be edified of all. 
I witness that God, our Heavenly Father, lives and that He loves us and knows us by name. That Jesus Christ is His only begotten Son, the Savior and Redeemer of mankind. That in all teaching and learning, the Holy Ghost is the true teacher, the revelator of all truth, the testator of the Father and the Son and the restored gospel, which is the doctrine of Christ. That Joseph Smith conversed with the Father and the Son that the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God, and it is true, and that Thomas S. Monson is God's prophet today, and he and fourteen other men are truly prophets, seers, and revelators. May we become better learners and teachers, so that when all have spoken, that all may be edified of all, and that every man may have an equal privilege. I pray humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.